Thank you, Boney and friends, for your music. And thank you, Busy, for your story. <laughs> and thank you for coming to a sermon called Suffer Through It. <laughs> Hopefully it's the heat and not the sermon. So. Um, so something we have in common is that we're all going to experience suffering. We all have or will lose someone precious to us. We have or will witness a child or loved one who is in pain. I've heard that pain is inevitable and that suffering is optional. But I believe that suffering is a natural and a universal part of the human experience. Another thing we all have in common is experiencing joy, hopefully like we did just now listening to the music. It could be watching a sunset or sharing a laugh with a friend, but we have all hopefully experienced joy. Joy has even recently become a buzzword in a political movement. The Kamala Harris campaign has capitalized on the joyful momentum of the Democratic Party and made it their campaign cry. These two emotions are emotional states, joy and suffering. Many people think of them as being on opposite ends of a spectrum. But what if instead we thought of them as being part of a Venn diagram? You know, those funny circles people make with some themes and uniting something smart in the middle. Let's think for a minute about suffering being in one circle and joy being in the other. In the middle of the overlapping circles might be spiritual growth. Or maybe where these two circles overlap is universal truth. You can think about this in a lot of different ways, but the point is that joy and suffering are part of the same experience. Around this time two years ago, a series of events unfolded in my life that shook my foundation. The specific events are really irrelevant. What matters most is recognizing a catalyst painful, life-changing events, and the choices I made following them. The circumstances left me in a state of disbelief, distrust, grief, and yes, a state of suffering. I was fortunate enough to have a friend at the time who was also something of a spiritual mentor. She insisted that I pick myself up, dust myself off, and show up for my students, my family, and my friends. She said that I could take a few minutes each day to have a pity party but then I should change a thought, move a muscle, or help someone else. I was angry, but I did what she said. I was also in pain. The pain felt like a giant boulder that was weighing me down. And at first, I wanted to let it obliterate me. Thankfully, I had the people and resources to carry the burden and to encourage me to keep going. Essential to my growth in the past two years was the recognition of the seemingly contradictory but equally poignant experiences of joy and suffering. While it has been a time of challenging circumstances, it has also been a time of great inspiration. Loss afforded me the willingness to begin to say yes to opportunities, small and large, that created a ripple of change and eventually heightened experiences of joy that I have come to describe to people as circular joy. So what is suffering exactly, and how do we define joy? Can they really exist together? The dictionary defines suffering as emotional or physical pain. Richard Rohr, a Franciscan friar and ecumenical teacher in his book, Just This, defines suffering as whenever you are not in control, and also when we are not getting our way. Ouch. <laughs> I will admit to feeling really uncomfortable when I first read this definition. I didn't believe that I had no role in, in the events that led to my painful circumstances. I for sure was not getting my way. How dare life do that to me? The truth is that during this period of upheaval in my life, I was absolutely reacting to events and people that were outside of my control. What I was able to control was how I responded to them, which is, at first, with fury. Richard Rohr also believes that our hearts need to be broken open at least once to discover what our heart means and to have a heart for others. In other words, we need to experience suffering in order to be empathetic. Richard Rohr is a pretty wise guy, I think. As my fury receded, I allowed myself over time to be broken open, just like Richard Rohr suggests, instead of being broken apart. 
What does it mean to be broken open? For me, it meant not allowing the pain, fear, and regret to turn me into a closed off and bitter person. Did I still experience those feelings? Yes, I did, and sometimes I still do. Choosing to be broken open, however, left me in a state of willingness to surrender to what the universe might offer me in the wake of this struggle. And one of the things that was absolutely still possible for me was joy. In his book titled Inciting Joy, Ross Gay explains that most people think of joy as meaning without pain or without sorrow. He writes, but this definition also suggests that someone may be able, might be able to live without or free of heartache or sorrow, which I'm pretty sure you only get to do if you have no relationships, love nothing, are a sociopath, and maybe are enlightened. He goes on to write, I don't know about you, but I check none of these boxes. <laughs> Neither do I. I did not instantly go from hurt to grateful or thanking the universe for wounding me. Like I said before, I was broken open, and while open is wonderful, broken is hard. Ross Gay goes on to question what happens if joy is not separate from pain. He writes, what if joy and pain are funda fundamentally tangled up in one another? Or even more to the point, what if joy is not only entangled with pain or suffering or sorrow, but is also what emerges from how we care for each other through these things? What if joy, instead of refuge or relief from heartbreak, is what effloresces from us as we help carry each other through our heartbreaks? Which is to say, what if joy needs sorrow? It's why I think of joy, which gets us, gets us to love, as being a practice of survival. Seeking joy, stumbling upon joy, practicing joy, even sharing sorrows, certainly were means of survival in the midst of my difficulties. During my season of saying yes, I began playing with a Brazilian drumming group called Sama de Vida that fellow church member Annie Wegner Laforte brought to this church two years ago for a summer sermon. Becoming part of this group gave me a place to be in community with other people who enjoyed music, liked to laugh, and in a short time they began to feel like family to me. There were times where I was slogging through difficult emotions, but knew the drums and the people would always lift my spirits. In the summer, our group practices outside along the Menominee Parkway in Wauwatosa. It is a delight to watch passers-by as they hear us playing. Some are walking, jogging, or biking, and they often stop and smile, or even start to bust a move. We used to have an elderly woman who has since passed away come in her wheelchair every week with her daughter who brought her, and she would smile and clap along. It was during these interactions with strangers, strangers passing by when I began to experience something new in my body. It wasn't completely unfamiliar, but it was bigger than I had ever felt before. I felt profound joy witnessing others show their delight in listening to our group perform. As they watched and listened, I could feel my joy reaching them through the drumming, then returning to me in their smiles and movement. I felt as if I had left my body and I was taken someplace above this scene where I could see the energy flowing between us. It was the pure embodiment of joy on both sides. I began to think of this feeling as circular joy, the giving and receiving of joy that can only happen when we are in relationship with each other. I experienced this over and over again as we performed in public. Last summer, we were on the river having a boat party when we, when we spontaneously started playing samba. People dining or having drinks along the river began to respond to the rhythms we created. They shouted out to us and moved their bodies. I remember standing at the front of the boat and thinking, this is circular joy. This is what it feels like to truly be alive. I thought to myself, I am grateful for all the garbage that I have gone through to get to this moment. It was all worth it for this one moment. I believe that had I not suffered, that this moment would not have felt so meaningful to me. My joy was my suffering, and my suffering was my joy. Richard Rohr explains that if there isn't some way to find deeper meaning in our suffering, 
and can even use it for good, we will normally close up and close down. The natural movement of the ego is to protect itself so as not to be hurt again. The soul does not need answers, it just wants meaning, and then it can live. He explains that a life lived fully and honestly inevitably invo involves both joy and suffering, a path of dissent, doubt, and lots of little deaths that teach us to let go of our artificially created self and to live in the simple joy of divine union. And voila, the true self stands revealed, fully present, and accounted for. I think the key idea that comes out of this quote is that we live in the simple joy of divine union. In other words, when we suffer together, we see one another and share something that makes us all the same. Working through suffering and finding joy requires us to be in relationship with one another. Sometimes being in relationship with others can simply mean playing music with people. I enjoyed my drum group so much that I took a drum workshop with one of our instructors, Boni Benavides, who is here today to share her talents with all of you. She's a music educator and advocate and a force in Milwaukee. I started with Afro-Colombian hand drumming class that led to other classes in Afro-Puerto Rican drumming and eventually being asked to be part of community drum performances. What started as a way to pass time and meet people turned into a domino effect of opportunities to play, perform, laugh, feel part of, and to share music with others. I was and am still so grateful to have been welcomed into this community of musicians and general celebrators of life. And now it has become a passion for me. The Afro-Puerto Rican drumming, which you experience here today, is a style called bomba. This led to our participation for me in what are called bombazos, which are a celebration of the bomba tradition. Bomba is Puerto Rico's oldest black and indigenous musical tradition and is still practiced today. In fact, it's on fire in Milwaukee. And if you see a bombazo advertised, I recommend that you go. Their ancestors use it to reconnect with their homeland, to create community, to survive, and to resist oppression. It is music of resistance. I believe Bomba to be the musical and cultural embodiment of joy in times of suffering. It has been transformative to participate in, and I hope you feel that as well today. Bomba has a tradition of healing and celebration. Just like Busy's story today about the loss of her grandmother, there can be healing and celebration in times of great loss. I was recently listening to an interview with musician and author Nick Cave, who tragically lost his 15-year-old son after he tried LSD for the first time and fell to his death from a cliff near their home. Cave talks about his choice to find meaning in the face of such a horrible loss. He shared this. I think this is a decision that we all need to make. I mean, this is not particular to me. This is ordinary stuff on some level that everyone goes through eventually in one way or another. We all grew, go through all sorts of things. We think we have a choice, I think. There is on some level a desire to turn inward and sort of wrap ourselves around the absence of the person that we've lost as if there's some sort of nobility in wrapping ourselves around the absence of that person. And I think this is a very dangerous situation and a mistake, and that we must be able to turn ourselves the other way and look at the world and understand that we are part of the world. There is joy and there is happiness in a way you could never believe possible on the other side of grief. It is the devastation that turns us into fully formed human beings. None of us wants to experience difficult, life-changing events, but most of us do. We can see these events as opportunities, even if we don't want to when they happen. I know that I didn't want to. But as Richard Rohr says, I know none of us like, like it, but simple suffering, not getting our way, is often the quickest and longest lasting form of transformation into love. I want to close with a story about my sobriety sisters. 
because it's largely their love that helped transform my pain to joy, my selfishness to service, my loss to abundance, and my heartbreak to love. One day recently, several of us were floating in my friend's pool. We were talking, sharing some of our gritty stories, and often busting out into deep, uproarious laughter. We were all on floaties, and at one point I felt myself drifting away from the group. So I grabbed the edge of somebody else's floaty and pulled myself closer to her. Then someone grabbed hers and pulled herself closer, and then another. Eventually we became connected like one big raft, a raft of support and friendship. It was beautiful. It was the sharing of all our joys and sorrows. It was joy. It was circular joy. May it be so.